Okay, great. Because I know there might be other people that want to want to see it. So I'm uh, really pleased that people are on. And Jordan, you don't know me, but it's great to have you here. And I was looking forward to meeting you. And I'll pass this on to have Melanie um, introduce you. People don't need to hear me. They know me. So we'll move on. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jordan Harshman uh, from the University of Alabama. What? Sorry, Auburn <laughs> in oh. Alabama. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, those, are, those are fighting words. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's one of those, you know. I, those, I, I get it. Yep. Yeah. Well, I, I used to teach at Clemson, so I know all about it. Um, yep. um, so Jordan is one of the uh, the new cadre of uh, assistant professors rising through the ranks uh, in ChemEd research uh, that who are, you know, just vitalizing the field. And, and we're really, really happy to have him here. Uh, he got his bachelor's at the University of Wisconsin in River Falls. And after a PhD uh, at Miami University with Alan Yazersky on high school teacher development, uh, he did a couple of postdocs, one with Noel, Nicole Becker, on causal mechanistic uh, reasoning, and then uh, Marilyn Staines um, on, on uh, undergraduate instructor professional development. He's now assistant professor at Auburn, as I <laughs> misspoke earlier, and he's going to uh, talk to us about the research that he's doing there. And I just, uh, he did send me a couple of personal things. Um, he has, uh, uh, his, he's married with a two-year-old son, uh, mm -hmm. And uh, he's an advocate for type one diabetics, which uh, is just fantastic. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to shut up and I'm going to let Jordan <laughs> tell us about his work. Thank you. Go ahead. Great. All right. Pop the share screen in here. Thank you so much for the introduction. And I'm uh, really excited to be presenting today, uh, particularly in front of folks that are uh, not just kind of in the educational practitioner side of things, but also in the educational research side of things. Um, and so I've, I've done my best to really tailor some of the, the research interests that I have to this particular audience. Um, and I hope you'll see some of those uh, shout outs throughout uh, the presentation. Um, so just two projects that I want to talk about, um, and specifically uh, project number two is going to get very little face time uh, throughout this maybe five, 10 minutes at the end. Uh, but project number one is going to be this idea of characterizing instructional practices. Um, it's, it's a study that was done a couple of years ago now, uh, but I really love the opportunity to tell the story that we didn't get to tell um, in, in kind of the initial rounds. And the rationale for kind of focusing uh, on this first project of why I, I think this would be kind of beneficial to have this conversation specifically in the Create for STEM uh, Institute is to try to think of this broader problem that we've been seeing, particularly in methods development in educational research. And I was trying to think of what source that I could uh, cite for uh, kind of concerns about maybe uses and misuses of statistics and quantitative research in education. And then I thought, well, again, if I'm trying to tailor this, uh, I might as well just borrow words right from Melanie Cooper, um, who wrote a fantastic article in 2018 uh, in Journal of Chemical Education. And kind of can be maybe summarized that the inclusion of seemingly sophisticated statistical techniques may provide the illusion of rigor, but it cannot substitute for a well thought out experimental design, a sufficient sample, and a plan for how the data will be analyzed. And so specifically, uh, what I want to do is just kind of provide this story um, that certainly is not going to be said, this is exactly how you should do it or, or anything like that. It's just this was our approach to finding this solution to how do we actually put that robustness um, into, into this uh, well thought out uh, kind of data analysis plan. Um, the other thing was I noted uh, that you guys have a great group here uh, that's specifically interested in kind of the automated analysis of constructed res according to the website here. Now, uh, I believe that's responses and open-ended uh, assessments. And um, I, I really just want to pitch this idea uh, rather uh, almost childishly of, I have an idea I'd like to run by you. And just to very clearly set the stage, um, the, the data analysis that we've done is so preliminary that I don't think I can in good faith like uh, support this idea. Um, but I, I think it's got a great promise. And, and I'd really love to hear uh, some input of, of what we think about uh, visualizing open responses and that sort of thing. 
All right, so let's kind of hop back to project one and I'll give you just a brief background of why we are interested uh, in instructional behaviors. Um, so obviously there's a variety of different ways that instructors in STEM would like to teach their classes, and those can range from uh, a kind of a didactic style to very active styles and very different learning rooms. And I, I would guess that most of you are familiar, of course, that some of those methods are better than others. Um, one of the things that I find interesting about this particular paper, though, is that most of the studies that it's relying on kind of break into this dichotomy of either your lecture or you're active. And that was obviously necessary for kind of methodological reasons. Um, but really, we wanted to think about, is there a finer grain analysis or characterization that we can look at uh, teaching in STEM that's maybe a little bit more uh, detailed that we can get of what specific types of active or, or what specific types of didactic uh, and that sort of a thing. Um, the reason for that is, is kind of from a pedagogical approach, it can be kind of a tough pill to swallow of saying there's really only two categories you need to fit uh, into one of them. I don't think that was the intention of this particular paper, but sometimes it can come across that way uh, to our STEM colleagues when they feel like you're, you're either with us or against us, and, and that's maybe not uh, the, the most effective way to, to induce change. And so we really wanted to characterize, you know, does that that dichotomy uh, kind of cover that? Um, uh, and, and so what, what other strategies can we characterize uh, if we go ahead and observe uh, classes? So some previous attempts uh, uh, before a study to uh, characterize instruction, um, a lot of times uh, for very practical reasons, they have to rely on self-report. Um, and of course, there's a lot of really great advantages to that. You can get uh, easily accessible samples, but there's also the big disadvantage that sometimes we as instructors are not always accurate or self-aware uh, that you know if we say we're doing certain things in the classroom, we might not be aware that, well, maybe we're not doing that to the extent or maybe we're missing things uh, that we have as, as well. And so it's really not based on any kind of an observation or an observation protocol um, or something like that. Um, so then if you flip over to, you know, the thing that kind of alleviates or attenuates that particular disadvantage, uh, it creates its own disadvantage, which is that doing observational uh, studies is extremely time consuming. Um, it's, it's much less practical because you actually have to physically be present or have access, um, you know, to someone who was present, uh, a recording or something of the class. Uh, and then, of course, we can only observe so much if we just observe and we don't do things like follow up with interviews or anything like that. We, we can get only snippets and maybe surface level features uh, of, of these particular classrooms. Um, all right, um, so this is uh, all the brainchild of Marilyn Staines. Uh, this was her project from the beginning um, and just uh, did a fantastic job of building this huge network uh, where we were able to collect over 2000 STEM classrooms across the country and make some observations on them using the COPUS, uh, which I'll just uh, briefly kind of uh, introduce you guys to if you're not familiar. Again, I'm kind of assuming uh, many of you have run across it. Um, and then where my part of the project and what I'm gonna really focus on here is kind of number two. Now we've got this giant data set. It's, it's an absolute playground for me as kind of a quantitative uh, focused person to, to play around with. Now, how do we get back to, again, what Melanie and others are calling for to kind of have this robust analysis uh, plan? Okay, so we're gonna move into the methods now at this point in time and talk about kind of the model optimization, um, kind of broadly in education research. And again, this, this annotated story. So the COPUS itself is uh, uh, something that takes 25 behaviors, 13 of them are student behaviors, 12 of them are instructor behaviors, and every two minutes, we're just going to document what happens. Um, I think of uh, a lot of the protocols that are out there, the big advantages is that this is a pretty neutral tool. It's an extremely reliable and transportable tool, very easy to train people up uh, in actually doing this. Um, uh, the obviously disadvantage is one that I already mentioned is it's a very surface level. We really get no evidence of quality. We get no um, maybe pertinent to this particular audience alignment with say uh, three-dimensional learning or, or anything like that. Um, and so it's, it's a very surface level kind of just what is happening in the class and, and that's about it. 
Um, so just for the record, you know, what we would copus this particular seminar as is I've been talking for seven and a half minutes. So we'd see uh, I've got lecture is going to get coded in three time slots and, and then listening uh, would be the student behavior. So the top two would be coded here and, and very little else uh, would be coded as well. Um, so again, we've got over 2,000 classes that comes from 709 courses, 548 different uh, STEM faculty, and it's across 24 universities. Uh, just to make sure we're all aware, these are all pretty research intensive, large universities. Uh, so we really can't generalize these out to community colleges, PUIs, um, or anything like that. They're all very US centric uh, as well. And um, we predominantly focused and got biology and chemistry classes. Those are gonna be the highest frequency, uh, but we do have some healthy samples uh, of, of all the other disciplines as well. We're also looking predominantly as it matches probably enrollment statistics, um, introductory level freshman software, uh, software, sophomore uh, classes uh, that are particularly large enrollment uh, represent roughly half of the data uh, that we're looking at here. Uh, but we do have all the way up to the graduate level so that we can investigate uh, some of the questions of how that might uh, break down. Okay, so this is the primary challenge then as we walk into this particular data set or a data set that might look like this. I've got 25 COPUS variables that I could include in a model for 2008 observations, and I'm trying to classify them into we don't know how many groups, right? Uh, we decided that you know anywhere from two to we're going to have to set a theoretical maximum of the number of groups and. Right off the bat, I, I think I just want to mention again, what is the big problem here? The big problem is that if we put on our scientist's hat and we want to be a scientist, how can I possibly say that there is one solution to this problem and I'm going to propose that solution to you that most adequately, most evidence to support this justification when in reality there are infinite number of solutions that you can have uh, to this particular problem. So we, we need an analytical process to kind of uh, figure out how we're going to get to the solution that we want to put forward. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and break this down into considerations that we're going to deal with the number of COPUS variables um, and, and kind of the down select process to include in our model. And then in a separate conversation, the considerations of, okay, how do we determine exactly how many groups, uh, how many instructional profiles, as we ended up calling them, uh, is adequate, is theoretically viable, and, and so on and so forth. So let's go ahead and focus on the left here and just focus on the 25 COPUS variables. Um, first of all, it's just from a statistics standpoint, that's likely too many variables. There's a lot of uh, quick rules about uh, specifically clustering data. Uh, two to the N is one of the most common ones. Uh, it's kind of in the middle of kind of more liberal or conservative estimates. Um, and so what we decided is that, you know, there's probably a hard cutoff here at 11 or 12 variables that, that we need to get this down to, which already represents kind of a theoretical issue. If the COPUS was defined with 25 variables, we're going to need to figure out how we can eliminate over half of them uh, in order to actually still tell us what the COPUS was, was trying to measure. Um, and so uh, that's kind of our target here is to get it down to somewhere around 1110. Um, we actually kicked it a little bit further than that. And so the next thing, of course, we want to do is any kind of quantitative research or qualitative for the um, for that matter, too, is, is going to have to be the theoretical viability uh, of the particular variables. So can we eliminate any of these variables just based on theory? And it turns out uh, there probably are some pretty good ways that we could do that, which is that we are looking specifically for the COPUS behaviors. What are those behaviors that are going to allow us to differentiate between more didactic styles of instruction and more active styles instruction? So things like TQ, which is tests and quizzes, uh, admin, which is just telling us about upcoming assignments, all those types of things, and a variety of other of these codes are probably not great because just by the presence or absence of that code, it doesn't really tell us a lot of information as to whether that class is active or, or kind of more didactic. Um, so that's one thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, and then we also want to make sure that the codes that are left actually do that. So we got rid of the ones that don't. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean everything that's left over does uh, to, to an equal extent. So we need to think about the codes that we're going to keep behind in these 25 variables that we're going to include in the model um, are going to be uh, things that represent active and didactic strategies. 
So then we move into kind of more of an empirical discussion. Uh, first of all, just descriptive statistics. Uh, the most common ways to look at the distribution of variables are going to be the classic box plot and histogram. Uh, but you can see that my box plot and histogram look a little bit different for something like the whole class, which is whole class discussion. Throughout our data set, whole class discussion was observed so infrequently that our box isn't so much as a box as a line because all three quantiles that are in the box plot are exactly at zero um, because so many people did not have any whole class discussion uh, coded. And one of the problems with this representation is that we're kind of trained to treat all of these right here as outliers. This looks like outliers, but that's kind of dismissing 364 observations, which is not in significant. Um, and so we're going to take a different visualization approach. And that says just take it variable by variable, assign a blank serial number that is corresponding to the rank of the value. Um, and so what that means is that observation number one is the lowest rank, and they all had an observation one of zero, the no whole class discussion. And that was the same for now you can tell roughly 1,750 of them uh, had zero. And then you can kind of see the spike that, that goes up. And this gives us a much more uh, a better picture of kind of this homogeneity of people who either have a complete absence of a code or inversely the complete presence where, where almost everybody had 100% or something like that. So a little bit of overload here. Uh, these are the 25 COPUS variables then. And what I'm going to do is kind of treat these as like a carnival game of all of these are little cardboard cutouts where you have to kind of shoot out a hole in the middle of them as we kind of down select from 25 uh, COPUS variables here. Uh, all the ones in blue are all student behaviors and all the ones in red are all instructor behaviors. So I already mentioned that there were a number of them that were theoretically not terribly viable. So we'll go ahead and just punch those out uh, right away. Um, and now we're going to go to our first empirical consideration, which would be the distribution. And so if you focus on, I, I gave whole class discussion before, it is so infrequent that this is not great for a clustering algorithm. And, and then we can say the same thing for a variety of these others that have kind of the same signal. It's not good for a clustering algorithm because the whole purpose of a clustering algorithm is to separate people out by a signal across many variables. What is likely to happen is if we put something like whole class, um, uh, whole class discussions into our model, um, eventually we're going to get a cluster that is just the people who have non-zero whole class discussion which is not terribly informative, um, right? If, if it's theoretically viable, then sure, but essentially the model is going to ignore every other variable that we've put in there and just isolate uh, that one variable uh, that comes out. So that's, that's really not ideal uh, when you're thinking about a cluster algorithm. The last empirical criteria that we have here is number four, is when we start thinking about things that are correlated with another thing. Um, so for example, um, listening right here, the students listening is highly correlated with lecture. And that's usually something that's the first code on a COPUS. Um, so we're going to cross out one of those. We just kind of pick one of them um, and say, I am going to remove the listening variable because I've included the lecture variable. The reason that you want to do that is because now now you need to think about parsimony within your model, which basically is the idea of the more variables you put into a model, the better it will explain data. However, that comes at the cost of the more it looks like your model is actually doing a really great job statistically uh, when it's actually not. It's just because eventually if you include all the models or all the variables that you can think of, you'll, you'll have that R squared if you think in that terms of, of 1.0, um, but you're really not adding any additional information uh, in this particular coins. And, and more to the point, you're putting in another variable. Uh, so we did that with uh, listening and lecture. We just uh, held on to the lecture, got rid of the listening. Uh, we did this with students answering questions because we kept teachers posing questions. Uh, inversely, we got rid of teachers answering questions because we kept students posing questions. And then we also uh, got rid of moving through groups MG because that was so highly correlated with one-on-one -on -one attention. And this is kind of like, think about an active learning class in an active learning space where the instructor is moving throughout the tables. Typically what they're doing is working one-on-one -on -one with students. So that information is duplicated and, and we would kind of get uh, rid of that. 
So what that leaves us with now is uh, nine variables. So our down select would be more or less complete at this point in time. And just to make sure that you guys are familiar, this would be working in groups with clicker questions, uh, working in groups with worksheets, and then other group work. Um, it would seem off the bat as if those three are correlated. Uh, they are actually incredibly not correlated because usually you'd only code one of them uh, at a time to represent that specific type of group work. Um, and then with the student behavior of students asking questions. For the instructional side of things, now we've got the idea of lecture, um, obviously something we would probably want to include in this, uh, following up, and that is something that uh, I'll talk about just a little bit more here. Um, teachers posing questions to students, these are non-rhetorical questions expecting an answer, uh, clicker questions that are being posed to students, and then working one-on-one -on -one, uh, with individual students. So this uh, follow-up code, uh, we actually had to add one more consideration because we actually got rid of that code theoretically because we actually had some pretty good qualitative data to suggest that certain swaths of our sample were, were misinterpreting that particular code, or I shouldn't say misinterpreting, uh, just not interpreting it consistently. Um, so if I pose a question to you and then I pose an additional question right afterwards, does that count as two teacher posed questions or does that count as following up the original question? Uh, there was a lot of disagreement in terms of that and I would say it's it's arguably it wasn't a terribly reliably uh, coded uh, variable and so for that reason we also eliminated that one. Okay, so now our down select is complete. We went from 25 variables to now eight variables that were included in our model. And again, just to refresh, now that we have those eight variables, can we theoretically think that this is going to represent to a reasonable degree, both active and didactic strategies? So if we kind of close our eyes and imagine what does a didactic class look like? What is an active class? What is a POGL class, a PLTL, a, a jigsaw, you know, all these types of things, can they be reasonably captured uh, by the variables that are here. And certainly we can make an argument that we are going to capture most, although very importantly, I might, uh, I might say that we're not going to capture all of them, right? So there, there are some pretty big limitations uh, that I'll point out to when we get to the uh, results here. Okay, so we've taken care of the left side in this kind of careful kind of analytic, uh, how are we down selecting here. Let's go back to the right side and think about now how many groups do we need to break this into, which is arguably a much more uh, difficult question. Um, so let's start right off with theory and think about, you know, what is a theoretically viable number of groups, right? Well, maybe if we have two clusters, uh, for example, and, and I can't guarantee this until you see the results, right? We would consider that there's an active group and a didactic group. And maybe for three, there is the active and didactic, but then a mixed or something like that. Maybe four, you can subdivide it even further. Uh, but the logic is, is that eventually you're going to get to a point, like let's think about 15 groups. 15 clusters, like, can we practically uh, really interpret that uh, with the eight variables that we now have landed on and looking at those eight variables, could we, with a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, say that particular cluster, that group is POGL, it's PLTL, it's, J, it's whatever, you know, instructional strategy that we're looking at. Um, and, and I think the answer is a pretty resounding no. Um, as I mentioned before, the COPUS is great for many things, but it's, it's really a surface level phenomenon. And if we're going to try to really differentiate between some of these specific uh, active learning strategies or specific instructional profiles, we're going to need a lot more information than, than what the COPUS can give us. So what this is giving us is kind of a theoretical uh, two is our minimum, but I don't know, 15, 20, this is a very qualitative judgment, has to be our maximum. Because at some point in time, we've we got to say enough is enough. We don't, we don't have the certainty uh, in our data to be able to, to stand behind this, even if uh, empirically it says the best model is, is 20 clusters or, or something like that. Okay, um, so a little bit more on the empirical perspectives uh, is again, what has the most evidence for the number of clusters. Um, this is where, again, I, I feel very comfortable in this group uh, of just kind of admitting that I, I wish there was more I had done in hindsight in this particular regards, um, because we calculated one index, one single index that's uh, specific to our uh, clustering algorithm that would try to inform us how many clusters are empirically the best 
best, which is basically a criteria of how much information you gain versus a penalty for adding an additional variable into your model, because by default, that will gain information. Did that additional variable uh, give you more information? Since uh, the, the publishing of this paper, um, I was able to find this paper uh, right here and these two, which, which compare no fewer than 30 different methods to actually determine the appropriate number of clusters. And in hindsight, I would have ran that and, and kind of looked at a consensus across all these different indices, which look at it from a variety of different perspectives and kind of take a consensus. Um, so we didn't do that initially. I will tell you just to sate my curiosity, I did it post uh, publishing of, of the work and, and it did actually conveniently land on seven, which is the ultimate uh, number of solutions that we land on, which I was really glad because I would have had a real kind of like, I don't know, ethical conundrum uh, on my hands if it had landed at like nine or, or five or something like that. Um, and then also, I think it's incredibly important, and this is maybe a more generalizable thing, if no one plans on running cluster analyses specifically, if you have any kind of machine learning algorithm, any kind of, uh, you know, data driven analysis, it is almost always the case that you can iterate the solution and run it more than once. If you can possibly generate more than one solution just by tweaking the details of the specific algorithm, um, I, I will go on a limb and speak pretty directly. I think that we as the educational field need to do better at iterating this and actually doing it. Um, and so I'll show you kind of what that looks like. Uh, Cause again, even if I decide seven groups, great. Well, there's still actually a number of sub solutions that, that I can pose. Okay, so let me go ahead and just introduce the idea of a clustering algorithm for those that, that aren't familiar um, and, and kind of just doing this at a very conceptual level. I'm happy to talk about a little bit more of the, the mathematics if anyone is uh, interested with it. Um, let's go ahead and just assume, uh, be perfectly omniscient for a second. And, and we know that there are seven kind of latent characteristics that lead people to respond in a similar but not exactly uh, the, the identical way across two variables. Keep in mind that we've already now selected in our, our study, in the COPA study, that we're actually choosing this in an eight-dimensional data set because we have eight variables, but let's just focus on two, two variables for now. Well, obviously that assumption, uh, we wouldn't know if we are the researchers, we don't know um, that because unfortunately we're not omniscient. Um, and so what we could do is we could theorize um, specific groupings uh, in this particular data. And then basically the clustering algorithm is what is going to uh, provide this tool to actually determine where those group divisions lie. Uh, if you say, I want to look at three clusters, four clusters, five clusters, and these are the groups or what we're going to call instructional profiles. Um, the problem, as I just kind of mentioned, though, is that you can get a variety of solutions. If you run algorithm one, you might get this solution. If you run algorithm two, you might get this solution. If you run algorithm two again the next day based off of a different random seed, you might get this solution. Right. And so ultimately, we have to compare all of those solutions to the truth, where the truth is obviously something that we will never know, because if we knew it in the first place, we wouldn't need cluster analysis. So at the at the impression, I'm just going to go back again to, to Melanie's own words. Here's a sophisticated looking algorithm, but honestly, it's it's providing an illusion of rigor because you could end up with a number of solutions that have nothing to do with each other, and you never know which one is is true, uh, whatever true means, right? So how do we work around this problem, and and how do we kind of uh, again present the evidence so that we're pretty confident in in the one that we work? Well, we got to dig into a little bit of how how a traditional clustering algorithm works. Uh, traditional algorithms are going to be hierarchical, k-means, partitioning around medians, two-step. Two uh, these are the very common ones that you see in educational research. Um, and, and I know this because uh, me and a great team, um, uh, Jordi Quadros at um, IQS Ramon Lowe University, have just put in a, a paper for LSE kind of reviewing uh, cluster analyses in educational research. Um, and what essentially these algorithms are going to do is they're going to come up with their groupings. And so this is the solution that they come up with. And the way they interpret that 
is you pick a single point and you say this point absolutely definitely for sure belongs to the yellow group according to this solution and this point absolutely for sure belongs to the dark blue group um, and the way i'm wording that is kind of leading you on to the problem is that they give you the solution here's who's in what group and they don't really give you a lot else to go on you, you don't have a lot to diagnose things on there are a number of independent uh, indices and algorithms that you can apply outside of the algorithm to kind of help you look at that uh, but the algorithm itself doesn't really tell you a whole lot about that the specific clustering algorithm that we employed was trying to avoid this problem and what i'm going to argue is maybe allows us to think about uncertainty as the you know kind of like recovering like analytical physical chemist inside of me is is trained to do right we always want to characterize our uncertainty in chemistry that's a, a big thing and so i'm going to apply that to now education research so instead of the algorithm actually picking and assigning people into a group what it's going to do is it's going to draw multivariate distributions and it's going to say the population should respond within this range and again it's a multivariate range and that sort of a thing and now when we interpret the solution we'll be able to have parameters such as this particular point we will say there is a 1.0 probability of belonging to the yellow group according to this model and again i would hope that in the create institute that the whole idea of modeling and three-dimensional learning there th this is now going to get placed into our research where we're we're not drawing a solution we're drawing a model and we can now evaluate how well that model uh, fits the data whereas we pick a point like this which is straddled between two distributions uh, we know that there's a lot less certainty on that point we would say something like that particular point has a 0.55 probability of belonging to the dark blue group a 0.45 of, of the green group uh, and, and that sort of a thing uh, so just kind of from an approach, uh, we decided this was the best way to go because it allows us to classify now our uncertainty to draw up like 95% confidence intervals um, and all that sort of things that, that maybe is more resonant to us as the native kind of scientist inside of us. Um, so let's come back to the considerations because all of that was technically leading into the third here of the empirical perspectives of how many um, uh, how many clusters, how many groups are we looking for. Um, in order to compare them in this particular model, uh, if I, for example, look at a three cluster versus a seven cluster solution, um, I can calculate a parameter that's uh, not specific to this algorithm. It's the BIC, the Bayesian information criteria, uh, that essentially is going to allow us to say, if I add that additional cluster, how much information did I get versus how many did my degrees of freedom essentially drop down, which, which again, rightly penalizes us because if you add a parameter to your model, like a class or something like that, you're, you're going to, by default, improve your model. Um, but the idea is, was that improvement worth it um, based on the information that you received? Um, and so what you're seeing here is a variety of different models. Um, I'll just interpret here the EEE model. What this does is you'll notice that all these distributions are different sizes, shapes, and orientations. Um, an EEE model completely constrains those so that the model has to draw equal size, equal shape, and equal orientation distributions. You can't change that. It's completely constrained. Um, and obviously, it does not perform terribly well. If you trace that green line, the VICs are, are quite low. Um, versus the VVV model is exactly the opposite, and it's completely unconstrained. You can model the size, shape, and orientation and allow each of those groups to change. Um, so theoretically, you want to think about which one of these makes the most sense before you just jump to the empirical. We have no reason to believe that uh, we will have equal sizes um, of these distributions, equal shapes or, or orientations. And so we chose a completely unconstrained model. Um, it still leaves us with a problem, though, because empirically now, the best number of solutions is, I don't know, anywhere from 7 to 15. And we did run this out to 20, um, and it gradually just kind of goes down. Uh, from there. So great. Uh, now we can run a cluster solution with anywhere from seven to 15 uh, clusters, which is not terribly helpful. Um, so what we did was we actually started running these solutions. And so if you start with the two cluster solution, let's say you've got uh, profile one, profile two. If we ran the three cluster solution, we saw those same two profiles 
plus a third one that kind of stole population dis, uh, density uh, from the first two, and so on and so forth, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. We always got these unique instructional profiles that kept coming up. But then something kind of funny happened around the eighth and the ninth. The eighth and the ninth, what happened was when that eighth cluster pulled out, it was either a completely nonsensical, completely uninterpretable cluster, or it was likely, uh, and or I should say, uh, an extremely small cluster representing about 0.2% of the entire data. We're talking like 20 people um, in a cluster that were clearly being pulled out for one variable and one variable only. You know, maybe this is the people who had the upper distribution of, of some fairly infrequent uh, COPUS code. And that pattern replicated all the way out through 15 and so now this is where we're coming back and we've, we've gone from theoretical to empirical and now we're back to empir uh, theoretical again that these solutions, anything past seven was really just kind of, it was not interpretable and kind of hitting that theoretical maximum that I had mentioned before about, can we realistically interpret these profiles? And, and it turns out we couldn't, um, we can't make sense of them and therefore they're not really useful to us uh, to include in, in our particular model. Um, so that is how uh, after long ado, we landed now at our final solution of eight variables from the COPUS and we're going to run a seven cluster model. Okay, so kind of the left and the right are, are now are, are taken care of. Uh, we still have more problems though, because with these particular algorithms, again, this is where the iteration uh, comes into thing. If you run the algorithm today, you'll get a result. If you run it tomorrow and use a different random seed, because all of these algorithms rely on some kind of uh, starting point that's completely randomized. Um, uh, those of you who have backgrounds in like uh, quantum chemistry or physics will know like maximum likelihood uh, algorithms and that sort of a thing can change the solution depending on where you start. So um, again, we still can't put forward that result until we show the stability. Um, so we want to run it several times. And by several, I mean 10,000. All right. So we wrote a program to run it 10,000 times, each time characterizing the log likelihood, which is how well does the model fit the actual data that we have, and then the mean uncertainty, which is every single point, what's the average uncertainty that we have. So the best solutions empirically are going to hang out here in the lower right-hand corner. Um, and so I saw this graph, um, I was a postdoc at the time, just transitioning into my role uh, at Auburn, and uh, I was extremely disheartened because how could you possibly put forward a solution that if you run it 10,000 times, what this is telling me is I am generating very likely 10,000 completely unique solutions. All right, so if I wanna say this one that I'm gonna present is the one that we're going with, what, what kind of evidence do I have to support that? Well, what we noticed is that there's actually clusters within these particular distributions. It's a bit of a Rorschach diagram, so I don't know if there's specifically three or two or four or however many like that. And we decided to take a closer look and say, even though each one of these solutions is completely unique and provides a completely unique solution, there is a question about how unique are they? Okay, just how different um, are these particular distributions? So what we did was we uh, uh, kind of looked into a random 10 of them I've highlighted here um, and then actually plotted the cluster sizes, the means per each eight variables, and so on and so forth. And we find out that they have some pretty good uh, homogeneity in terms of what they're requesting. And even better, when we plot out multiple of them, now I don't have to say there are exactly, so cluster five, there are exactly 4.2% of our data belong to cluster five. I can present a range. Um, and even if I really wanted to, again, this is a hindsight moment, I would have gone back and written an algorithm to look at all, you know, 6,000 algorithms uh, or solutions right here and present a confidence interval, um, which again, for me is just, it's so much more comfortable to say, I think that there is about anywhere from four to 5% of our population in this distribution. Uh, let's go back to sig figs, like one sig fig is, is all I'm giving you here, because that's, that's the level of certainty and confidence that I have with this. Uh, this is a very imprecise type of thing. It can give us very broad overviews. We shouldn't be interpreting this to the fourth decimal place or, or anything like that. 
Um, so now armed with that knowledge, we know that most of these solutions in here, even though they are completely unique, it's likely you're talking about maybe anywhere from one to 20 people per cluster kind of jumping ship and, and swapping around into different clusters. Um, and so what we thought is that that's, that's pretty close enough for us. We, we don't need an incredibly uh, detailed uh, view of that. This isn't life or death, but it does gives us a, a really good kind of classification. I, um, so the last thing that still comes with the analytic process is actually how to visualize the results. Um, and if ultimately this entire process, I'm going to argue, and uh, maybe you'd agree, was messy, right? There was no clear, uh, straightforward path. And therefore, I think when we visualize and we communicate those particular results, uh, that communication and visualization will also likely be quite messy. And that is because we want to show things like, yes, the average, but I don't want just the average. I need to show the data through a distribution. So I'm going to include a box plot and I'm going to include each each individual data point in that cluster. So we really get a sense of what is the characteristic, what is the profile uh, of that thing that, that we actually had in the solution. Um, and so what we did post in the supplemental was this image. Um, I fought really hard to try to get into the main article. I got rejected. Um, and so we put it in the supplemental because I think this is th the more honest way to talk about these profiles as it very clearly shows that sure, cluster number one, which is 37.6, uh, let's go ahead and just interpret this one real quick, basically has everyone is uh, no, uh, no uh, group work in worksheets, there's no other group work, there's no clicker questions, and on an average, roughly 12%, I think it was, uh, of the time, students would ask questions. Um, on an average, we've got no one-on-one -on -one working, we've got no clicker questions posed by the uh, teacher, and then we also have about 20, 22% of, of the time where the teacher is posing questions. And then this little rocket ship taken off for space is going to be the lecture, uh, chilling out at about 83% on average. Now, you can imagine that visualization and what that looks like without the box plots and just the averages, that gives us one signal, but a signal that I would argue is quite misleading because even though we eventually called this the didactic cluster, and it represents about 37.6% of our data, here I'm disobeying my sig figs thing from earlier, let's just interpret that as anywhere from 36 to 38% is maybe a confidence range I would, I would put in on that. And you'll see here I stuck with it at 55%, uh, one sig fig, uh, two sig fig, sorry. Um, and so then uh, when I look at this, um, I can see very clearly there's some theoretical problems with calling this a didactic cluster, which kind of says, oh, this is clearly a, a, a lecture based only, lecture only uh, cluster. How can you call it a lecture only cluster when there are these observations down here, uh, plenty of people, maybe upwards of 20 in this particular cluster who have no lecture whatsoever. How can I, how can I say that that's, uh, or I should say no, under 50% under of the class was lecture. Um, so what explains that is we actually looked into these folks. Um, these guys right here are going to be your people who were uh, relying on student presentations throughout the entire course. And why didn't that show up? Well, it's because student presentations was not one of the eight variables that we chose in our model. Um, so now you see kind of, you know, the, 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 the disadvantages, the limitations that we have uh, with this specific um, analysis. Again, hindsight is 2020. I might consider going back and just removing some of those people that have non-zero, um, you know, in some of these really infrequent ones. Uh, we didn't do that. I, I go back and forth as to whether uh, we should have uh, or not. Okay, uh, so the summary, the big takeaway here is this this very long-winded uh, kind of analytical detail is, is, is what I hope is going to invite a discussion about how do we actually model data in educational research, um, and, and I'd just love to hear uh, perspectives of how other people do this in other contexts and other uh, statistics uh, and, and that sort of thing. But it's, it's really, uh, what I'm going to argue is, uh, at least we were able to present the amount of evidence that we were uh, able to present by, you know, again, combining these theoretical and empirical perspectives, uh, being very transparent and justifying every algorithmic detail, definitely avoiding this one and done. I think that's really important. Uh, the one and done is say, we ran a cluster analysis, and that was it. Um, I, I think that we really need to be careful uh, not to do that. 
and then um, kind of identifying our uncertainty, characterizing it, displaying it, and I hope that uh, I'm showing some vulnerability even in this particular talk that there are aspects of the solution that we put forward that I, I don't know if I stand behind fully. I, I predominantly stand behind it, but uh, hopefully we've characterized our uncertainty to communicate that. Um, and then, of course, uh, how we choose to visualize our results. Uh, the, the motto should be to reveal, not conceal um, our data. And, and I think oftentimes means and standard deviations uh, can, can do a disservice in kind of concealing a lot more of that story. Okay, um, so I really try to think of like a kind of creative, clever way to transition into the next problem uh, project. I don't have one, uh, so full stop and just completely different thought. Um, I, I'd like to shift attention now to uh, what is really a side project that I've had a fantastic undergrad, Emily Cable, uh, is working on this with me. And we've been working on it for a couple of months. And, and again, it's, it's really at its infancy stages. And I want to give you this idea of uh, what do we do when we have uh, a free response uh, question that we ask. We know that there is a wealth of information, uh, but we also know that it takes a long time to abstract that information. And again, um, create, you guys have a, a whole dedicated group that's that's approaching this from a completely different direction. Um, I'd really love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, if we ask a question, say, what is the difference between a weak and a strong electrolyte? Um, and I've got 197 responses. Um, again, I don't want to go through all of them uh, and, and look at them myself. So what's potential solution number one? Um, really low means uh, is a word cloud, right? We could just pop everything up in a word cloud. Um, cleaning steps that we took here is obviously we fixed some spelling errors, uh, remove stop words, the, are, you, all those types of things. Uh, and then we did stemming, which is why the largest word is dissoci, which is a placeholder for dissociate, dissociated, dissociating, dissociate. Uh, all that kind of stuff, and it all gets combined into uh, the stem uh, of the word. The advantage is that this was relatively easy to produce. You can produce it on wordle.com. Uh, it's very easy. The disadvantage is that for a question like this, it's not terribly helpful because what it misses is that we need to understand how people are connecting ideas. Um, so if you're not familiar with the chemistry behind this, typically a, an electrolyte is defined based on its conductivity, but we then formally usually talk about it in kind of ionic liquids or um, aqueous uh, solutions as, you know, strong, um, strong electrolytes completely dissociate, they break apart, and therefore they will conduct electricity, whereas weak electrolytes uh, partially dissociate. So you can see those ideas, but you don't know how many have connected specifically weak electrolyte with partially dissociates. We, we don't know that information based on the word cloud. And so um, I really don't think that this is a, a terribly helpful uh, way to do it. As I've kind of mentioned, uh, solution number two is the exact opposite. Um, the huge advantage is that if you just did flat out open coding in, in a standard um, qualitative analysis, very accurate. This is the gold standard. Um, the disadvantage is it's extremely time consuming. Um, I, I shouldn't say extremely. Uh, if it's one question, maybe that's manageable, but um, you know, it's, it, it is quite time consuming and usually you have to have a dedicated person to do that. So what I'm going to try to do is try to balance in between these two things. Can we find something that's a visualization that is relatively quick and relatively accurate um, and try to balance best of both worlds? And uh, we found this idea was maybe through the solution of a chord diagram. So we're balancing accuracy and efficiency. Uh, these are used uh, commonly in a lot of biological fields, any kind of omics, genetics, um, and basically uh, at their cart, just display the number of times that string A is attached or preceded to spring B. And they do this with, you know, genome sequences uh, quite often. Uh, so let's take an example interpretation with some generic data here. Uh, if I look at this one strand, this one link, uh, what it's telling you is roughly between 20 and 30, roughly 10, 11 people are going to connect the ideas of S3 and E5, whatever that means. So in our example, it might be connecting strong to electrolyte. Uh, and that happened 11 times, for example. That's what the data uh, suggests. Uh, versus if you look at this little spaghetti strand over here, that is saying that uh, the connection from S2 to E2 only happened one time. Um, and, and we can kind of do that. 
Um, so that's the kind of way of how you interpret uh, these particular diagrams. Uh, so let's see how that actually works uh, in, in a real study um, and, and kind of pushing it uh, to, the, to the next level here. Um, the hypothesis is that we would be able to then see those connections and implicitly connect strong electrolyte with completely dissociate versus uh, connecting weak electrolyte with partially dissociate. And that's, that's, the, um, uh, that's the kind of idea here. Um, so ultimately, we didn't just ask that one question. We ended up asking 10 questions, and they were designed. Um, they're not validated or, or anything like that. This is just kind of a quick and dirty um, study where electrolyte questions were largely questions that we felt would give responses that are common phrases, such as strong electrolytes completely dissociate. Forward phrase um, that, that should show up repeatedly versus if we start talking about the quantum model of the atom, that's something where now now we're getting into more essay type responses and, and we're kind of hypothesizing that the core diagram is not going to be a great tool uh, for the quantum questions. Um, just to, again, make sure I'm, I'm respecting your guys' time, I'm only going to focus on the results for two of these questions uh, in the electrolyte, um, just because it was pretty clear, as you're going to see, that it, it, our hypothesis was not met um, and there's a lot of work yet to do. Um, so just a reminder, we've got 197 Gen Chem 1 students from three different classes. Uh, this is post-instruction, and it's all extra credit. Um, so let's take a look at our first uh, cleaned data set word uh, uh, core diagram here when we look at the difference between a strong and a weak electrolyte. Um, so first of all, I just want to say I find them very aesthetically pleasing. Um, to actually produce the core diagram is running one line in R, and then they're done, and then it's good to go. The cleaning is uh, significantly more work than that. Uh, so I'm looking at 169 responses. Let's go ahead and see if we can actually see any of these trends and relationships that we're looking at. At. Um, so let me just highlight here, the phrase strong electrolyte completely dissociates would likely be highlighted in this particular strand. I'm, I'm removing some excess information that allows you to see how many people. Uh, we felt like that was a little bit of overload uh, at this point in time. But you can see one of the thicker strands here, strong electrolyte to dissociate and then strong electrolyte to completely is, is kind of the idea here. Um, uh, conversely, you can think about uh, weak electrolytes partially dissociate would likely get lit up in this particular phrase and these two strands that come along. But then, of course, there's always the problem, and this is where things start falling apart a little bit, is if you have a connection between something like weak electrolyte and completely the initial assumption is that that's likely an incorrect answer. However, because of the fantastic uh, characteristics of the English language, you can just simply say weak electrolytes completely dissociate, which is incorrect, or you could say weak electrolytes do not completely dissociate. And so the negative version of that now negates it, and we have no way of showing that uh, in the core diagram as it currently exists. The other thing is that you've got this long, thick blue strand. This is the thickest uh, link on here, and it is almost completely useless, uh, should be the word over there it gets sent to, because again, this can represent uh, correct ideas, uh, strong electrolytes completely dissociate, uh, incorrect ideas, or, or other correct ideas, just by using those particular uh, word pairings. Uh, one more thing uh, to kind of help us uh, uh, figure out why this is not exactly great at the moment is that that particular strand represents 139 out of 169 responses. Um, and so it kind of makes us think, well, there's got to be some responses here that, that are not using that phrase and are all the responses shown? And the answer is no. The chord diagram I'm showing you is filtering any frequency pair that's greater than four. If you really want to look at what the full data data set looks like, it's not terribly helpful. Okay, so there's obviously a lot of things in here. And if you try to look into which we've looked into, some people are talking about electronegativity, um, nonviolet, non something like that. Uh, we, we try to look into some of these things that are not getting picked up into some of the main strands. And it turns out there's still some very relevant ideas and even some correct and incorrect ideas that we really need to characterize and do a lot more cleaning uh, than we originally thought to, to make these things uh, useful. 
Um, so then, of course, we just wanted to present some evidence that maybe it was just this type of question, this response, there was something about it. So I'll just present one more question um, and just very quickly uh, look at this particular diagram, uh, which is examine whether or not the following species is a strong, a weak, or a non-electrolyte, and we give the dissociation of acetic acid. Um, and so this is a, the common phrase here is going to be, as we've highlighted, a weak acid is a weak electrolyte. Um, and what you'll see is out of 155 responses, 89 of them made this association and said, you know, weak acid to weak electrolyte, that, that type of association, um, which turns out in this particular case, we did a really quick kind of grading of this particular question. Um, it's pretty darn close to the percent correct. Um, I think it was actually like 95, 96 people uh, got the correct answer when we kind of graded it this way. And so it, it, I, I would guess that just out of happen circumstances, why these kind of agree so much, uh, but it does at least show some kind of promise that this could be used to, to kind of broadly represent a, a large swath of qualitative data. Okay, so obviously there's a lot more work yet to do in these chord diagrams. I'm just presenting this as, I really think it's a cool idea. Um, I, there's a ton of data cleaning that needs to go into it, but if it could be automated in some fashion, which of course it could, we could post this on a website and have people uh, make these diagrams uh, particularly pretty easily. But obviously there's there's a number of things that, that we need to do. And so at this point in time, I will say that uh, I just love to hear any input uh, specifically from the people who have expertise uh, uh, much more than I do about how to clean English language, how to deal with uh, the negating problem of adding a not uh, in, in there and, and that sort of a thing. Um, so with that, I, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge all the fantastic people I've had to work with. Uh, with Copus Dataset, again, this is entirely Maryland's project. Uh, I just felt really um, uh, kind of grateful to come in on the analysis side and, and get to play around in a large data set. Um, we obviously didn't collect 2,000 observations uh, without a lot of individual faculty at a lot of individual institutions. And let's just make sure that this is very clear. These are not my grants. Um, these are the grants that helped uh, create the people uh, to get the COPUS data that we use uh, for that. We always want to thank the instructors and students who made the projects possible. And then with CORD diagrams, uh, Emily is now applying to grad schools. Um, she's doing uh, really great and I think she's going to do great things. Uh, with life. So I also thank you guys for your attention and I'm really looking forward to any questions that you have on either of the projects. Okay, uh, please join me in thanking Jordan uh, virtually <laughs> for a great seminar and uh, like he said, I am sure he is, uh, whoops, I didn't mean to do that, I meant to clap. Um, I'm sure is uh, happy to answer questions, as he said. So uh, without further ado, either in the, um, in the text or just turn your camera on and uh, go for it. And, you, and, you, and, you're all, and, you, and your uh, microphone. <laughs> Looks like Danny and I will have a chance to chat yeah. later. Yeah, I think a few people are going to have to run, uh, but yeah. um, we'll record the question and answer as well in case people are um, do have to do that. Oops. Uh, John, looks like maybe you have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. So so um, thanks very much for the for the talk. Um, great talk. Uh, not being one who's extremely strong in, in statistics, I have a question about, you know, when does it matter how much uncertainty there is? So with the clustering, it seems like the the, the bigger picture there was to try to get get some handle on the kind of the, the range or or um, or or um, somewhat specific types of instruction you saw. And so does it really matter if, you know, some of the people were in the wrong group? And so how do you kind of balance that statistical rigor with kind of what's the purpose of doing this? And does it really matter if there's a, a bit of uncertainty there in, in kind of the, the final solution? 
Yep, um, that's a great question. And I think it really comes down to, again, the theoretical and, and what we might call the consequential validity. Uh, what's the consequence of being wrong is, is ultimately what that boils down to. Um, these clustering techniques are used in like medicinal fields to catch diagnoses of certain diseases. Um, so there the stakes are a lot higher and therefore the certainty needs to be a lot greater. Um, when it comes to characterizing instructional profiles, the biggest thing that, again, I kind of leaned into the introduction was we have this initial kind of lecture or active right now, um, and our didactic active is, is kind of the, the, the default way that a lot of people are seeing this. I would have to argue that, you know, at least something should be better than that. So that casts a pretty wide uncertainty that I'm pretty okay with having. Um, however, we also then have a website where you can upload your Copus profile and then get categorized into one of those categories. And that's something that still kind of, um, it gives me a little uneasy in terms of how instructors use that because now we are specifically labeling you into that category that has a little bit of a higher uh, maybe psychological um, uh, consequence of, you know, okay, I did this really active class and I got labeled into one of these uh, kind of lower or at what you perceive as lower or not accurate and that sort of thing. And therefore that kind of gets, oh, maybe we need a little bit more certainty with that. So I don't think I can answer that with a specific, like we should be within 5% of, of a mean or something like that, a, a hard quantitative cutoff, um, other than just to say that the factors that factor into that decision has got to be uh, the consequence of, of making a mischaracterization. And then of course, back to the theory, um, how, how many uh, strategies and instructional profiles are theoretically viable? Um, is again like a Pogel or PLTL, all these different active learning strategy techniques, um, should they have their own instructional profile? What is the utility of, of that? I, I guess I have a follow-up question to that, which is um, why do we care? I, I, I don't mean to mm -hmm. put it so, I do no, mean no, to put it so bluntly. <laughs> yes. I think, I think um, you know, why why does it 